In the Star Wars Galaxy, the average cost of a small freighter is well within the range of your average consumer's budget. The used market has even more options, some under 25,000 credits, which is certainly obtainable for your average family or small business. It makes a lot of sense from the Republic's point of view to keep the price of starships low enough to give its citizens mobility so that if there is economic decline or conflict or a natural disaster, people are able to freely move to where the jobs and economic activity are, and there are less individuals who need help and need aid from the central government. And that's why having affordable starships is as important as the 1950s post-World War II era economic expansion in the United States that saw the creation of a national highway system and the widespread adoption of automobiles. In the United States, most families purchase not just one car, but two or even three. Now, in our own timeline, automobiles became more available because of the massive industrial mobilization done by the United States in order to supply the Allies with weapons and vehicles. Every major Ally power from the Soviet Union to China to the Commonwealth powers were all receiving either resources, fuel, gear, vehicles, and weapons from the United States. And we were able to do this probably because we mobilized our entire society. Women entered the job markets courageously taking up roles that their even braver husbands left to go fight in the conflict. And as a result, in the post-war period, you had massive amounts of industrial infrastructure, improved logistics, improved resource management and processing at the national level. You had a consumer base that was increasingly wealthy with many GIs returning home Home with cash in their pockets, and now women and minorities were also allowed to participate in the economy, which only grew the overall economic pie. Plus, the United States was one of the few countries to end the war much stronger than it actually started. There's very little damage to the actual infrastructure that ran the industrial and economic system. And while cars post-World War II were definitely more expensive than before the conflict, the average American had also become significantly wealthier because of all of the big government projects related to the war and the Great Depression before it. And so wages were surpassing costs and now people were driving everywhere. Now you'd think that starships had a similar eureka moment, just like automobiles, that kind of made them affordable to the masses. Well, you can point towards the creation of the first hyperspace lane or the invention of the hyperdrive as a catalyst. But actually, I think the most important thing that made ships affordable to the average consumer was they basically changed where starships were built. Why is space travel unaffordable here on Earth? Well, it's mainly because the amount of energy required to escape Earth's gravity is enormous. You need tons of rocket fuel to burn you to escape velocity. And the problem is that fuel also weighs a ton, and so only a small percentage of your entire system is going to be dedicated to the command module and payload. Everything else is just fuel. This is all going to cost a ridiculous amount of money, and so this is why only a handful of nations in the world actually have a discretionary budget that allows them to run a space program. It's only been in recent years, thanks to the likes of entrepreneurs like Elon must that we start seeing a flux of private entities venture into space, which can only mean one thing. The economic model is starting to make a little more sense, whether it's through stuff like Starlink or transferring goods to the ISS. Although, you know, SpaceX is still very far from being profitable. It's still in its CapEx spending phase. But for humanity to actually enter the space age, you know, to get to a point where the average person can afford to go to space, not just Katy Perry, or the average person can afford to buy a starship, not just Jeff Bezos, it will require a fundamental change in how we manufacture these starships. We'll actually have to move the entire supply chain for building ships outside of the planet's gravity well. Not only is it costly to lift materials out of a planet's gravity well, ships built on the surface have to be engineered to survive not just in space, but also the violent takeoff process, which really does limit overall performance. So let's say you want to launch 10,000 pounds of payload into space. And it's actually kind of light. It's much lighter than what the Apollo module and the Soyuz module weigh. Well, we need roughly 10 to 50 times the weight in fuel to just reach low orbits, making this launch method highly inefficient. And this is really the reality facing early spacers on Coruscant, especially back before the repulsor anti-gravity technology was invented. People mostly use rocket boosters, just like the ones found on the Techno Union hard cell interstellar transport. So this means you have an extraordinarily heavy launch vehicle and more than 90% of that weight is fuel and should be shed once the ship reaches low orbit. And because you don't have anti-gravity technology, you're not able to just coast your way out of a planet's gravity well at like, you know, a steady 1000 kilometers per hour. 
Instead, you have to hit a minimum of 17,500 miles per hour to enter low orbit on Earth or closer to 25,000 miles per hour to completely escape the planet's gravity. A ship that flies at 1,000 kilometers per hour aerodynamically is very different from a ship that can reach escape velocity. At 1,000 kilometers per hour, you don't need special materials, just the standard aluminum hull or carbon composites is fine. So is Durasteel. You also have control surfaces like wings, flaps, rudders, unless you're just completely running on repulsors, that is. All in all, it's a comfortable ride with some minor turbulence here and there as the blue of the sky fades to black. It's probably a very nice and calming experience. Now, you times that speed by 20, suddenly the air resistance outside the ship becomes ridiculously high. The air is basically superheated and turns into plasma. And so you really need heat tolerant materials on the outside of your ship, like ceramic heat tiles, ablative shielding, something that is most likely available in the Star Wars Galaxy, but just, you know, you're going to have additional costs associated with that. You also can't have any protrusions on the hull for like sensors or cameras because they'll just be melted off in the process. As far as controlling the ship at these speeds, you can do a little RCS thrusting, but uh, adjusting your angle of attack more than a little bit at these speeds will lead to catastrophic consequences. Everything on this vehicle needs to be exceptionally strong. It can't buckle and needs to maintain stability. Many of you guys might remember seeing one of the shuttle crashes in the 80s and 90s. At those speeds, messing up your aerodynamic profile is not a recoverable event things tend to disintegrate very quickly. You also are going to have huge vibration and acoustic loads that can potentially damage more fragile computer systems and sensors that become more important in the later stages of the mission. Such launches are also planned far ahead in time with a careful eye towards weather systems that could impact the launch. So basically a launch vehicle from Earth is just too niche of a product. Too much of the energy and design is focused on just escaping, and the tiny capsule that is left for actual space flight and exploration has only limited capabilities once in orbit. But as we see, once you get into vacuum, things do become incredibly easy. All the Soyuz and Apollo modules needed to move in vacuum were low-powered reaction control systems that often just used cold thrust or just gas under pressure being released, like nitrogen, for movement. In a microgravity environment, everything becomes relatively weightless, and that is incredibly important to pay attention to if you are the firm that is trying to build these massive structures. There's a reason why in the Star Wars Galaxy we have ships that are, you know, dozens of miles long or 20 miles long. Simply put, when you build things in space, the amount of energy you expend in order to lift objects, combine objects, is going to be considerably less than on Earth. Now, one way we do get around this problem on Earth is by building large vessels in modules and then just combining those modules together. This way, when you are lifting heavy things, you're only lifting one section and not necessarily an entire ship. When you have an orbital shipyard, you still can use that same modular construction, but now moving those pieces together can be as easy as just attaching a Krillian tugboat like the YT-1300. Once two pieces are in place, you can have welders or Georgia jetpacks connect the pieces in a zero-G environment. Because everything is weightless, again, you're not going to be putting a lot of stress on this one, two, ten mile long structure. You're just limited by your resources, your manpower, and your imagination. That is how the Empire managed to build something as large as the Death Star. They didn't really need proprietary technology, at least for the shell. They just needed brute force and manpower. On a side note, in vacuum, a phenomenon called cold welding can happen. And this is basically because when two metal plates touch and there's no air molecules separating the um, two plates at the atomic level, the atoms actually start fusing together, and so two pieces of metal can fuse in vacuum relatively easily. This isn't an actual building method or anything that can be used because it's, you know, pretty unpredictable. And when things do cold fuse in actual space missions, it's usually an accident and seen as a major problem. But who knows, maybe one day when we have orbital shipyards, scientists and engineers will develop materials and methods to make cold welding an actual way to join ships. And because these welds happen at the molecular level, they are going to be stronger than your more traditional uh, welds or using rivets or anything like that. This whole method kind of reminds me philosophically of all those uh, wooden joints used in Japanese carpentry. Now let's get back to this orbital shipyard. If you are going to assemble a ship in low Earth orbit, you're also going to need to keep the parts cheap as well. And the only way you can really do that is to also produce all of these things outside of a planet's uh, gravity well. You get probes to scan the asteroid belt for resources, which then can be mined by droids or, you know, 
crews of miners. And then you can take all of those resources and have them processed in a furnace on the moon and then turned into some type of finished resource in a factory. Although they'll probably have to figure out how to keep all the moon dust out of everything because that is going to be a significant problem. Then you take those resources and you start manufacturing the final components and parts that make up a ship, all in a zero gravity environment to limit the amount of energy used. And when you have no gravitational stress and you're designing the structure of your ship, well, you can really get away with things that you normally can't ground side. You'll start seeing very unique shapes that you normally wouldn't see. You can have long rotating habitats that generate artificial gravity, spindly looking space stations with different modules connected to it. The ships you build up in orbit don't technically ever have to go ground side. You can just park above planets and take shuttles down to the surface. Without structural limitations, you can also build very beautiful and open spaces that look quite different from the cramped spaces we usually envision starships having. And of course, all the maintenance, all the repairs and the upgrades, that can be done in a microgravity environment environment as well, which of course will speed up everything and make everything a lot cheaper. Once the first orbital shipyards are built, once the first asteroids are mined, you are looking at the beginning of a golden age for space travel. The cost for making it to orbit will be drastically reduced in one day. Maybe buying a ship will cost as much as it costs to buy a car today. Although I do have to admit, we'll probably never figure out the anti-gravity kind of repulsor lift technology, so we'll still have to rely on thrusters to get up. You know, into into orbit. But it's still possible that in the future we have specialized entry and escape vehicles just for that purpose, and then purpose-built space voyagers that can go from system to system and travel much longer. So there you have it, guys. Just some thoughts about how we can enter our own space age here on Earth. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button down below so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content. As usual, my name is Alan, I'm reminding you that my allegiance is to the Republic, to democracy. I'll see you next time.